do you think is Scotland's greatest military leader? Robert Bruce? William Wallace? Good Sir James Douglas? I think they may all have been eclipsed by today's intrepid hero. To start a story, I've brought you to a place that some of you'll recognise as the courtroom and the dock in which Claire Randall and Gellis Duncan were tried in Outlander. In fact, it's a church connected with a man who would meet his own day of reckoning. The question that I'm here asking today is, was he the greatest Scottish military leader ever? Here in this churchyard on the 1st of September 1644, the man who held the King's warrant as Lieutenant Governor of Scotland stopped to ask for a drink of water. The minister, the Reverend Balnevis, naturally obliged, an act for which he was later censured by Perth Presbytery. Now the duly refreshed gentleman set off to a battle on the other side of this churchyard, which would see the first ever use in mainland Scotland of the Highland Charge. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. The War of the Three Kingdoms. You might call it the English Civil War, if you're a foreigner, a Daily Mail reader, or simply poorly informed. Now, I know the last two mean exactly the same thing, but at least the threes just sounds better. It's rhetorical rather than factually accurate. Just like the Daily Mail. Look, a series of civil wars across the British Isles in the 17th century were started by Protestant Covenant and Scots who said that Charles I could never be above the Scottish Church. This video explains it better. There'll be a link at the end. The whole thing was really messy. Today's hero started on the side of the Protestant Covenanters, but he was also a Royalist. So part way through, he switched to the Royalist side. To be fair, the Covenanters also switched to the Royalist side, just not at the same time as him. So in this churchyard, on the 1st of September 1644, he was on the side of the Stuart monarch, but the Covenanters weren't. Yet. I hope that makes sense. So, today's hero was a Scotsman newly arrived from England following the Royalist defeat at the Battle of Marsh and Moor. His job was to tie up Covenanter forces here in Scotland, hopefully even draw some of the Scottish Covenanting army in England back north, thus relieving Charles I's position in Englandshire. The fact he arrived with two mates and was holding out in the Methven Woods over there to the north tells you how strongly the King's writ ran in this part of the world. At least for that month. But hopes lay in troops coming from Ireland. 10,000 Irish troops had been promised. But when they landed at Ardnamurchan, there were only two and a half thousand. Never mind. The plan was for them to join up with troops of the Marquis of Huntley in Aberdeenshire. He'd raised 250 horse, stolen some cash and ammunition from the army in Aberdeen, and then galloped about a bit, and then fled to Sutherland. All right, two and a half thousand Irish foot soldiers it is then. Then they discover that the Marquis of Argyll was on his way with a proper covenant and army. Oh no! So our Irish foot soldiers hightailed it across country to Blair Athol. Now, the clan Robertson were none too happy with the arrival of two and a half thousand Irish troops and they drew up ready for battle. Just in time, our hero arrives and pulls out his King's Warrant, only just preventing a battle between the Irish and the Highlanders, who eventually shook hands and joined together in a small, indisciplined, poorly provisioned ragtag army. They came down through the small glen to find there was a force waiting to defend its southern end. Now, in a stroke of luck, the defending troops were led by our hero's cousin. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Do you want to change sides? Och, all right. They camped just west of here overnight, but they were the royalist meat in a covenant and sandwich. The Marcus of Argyle was to the west in Stirling, and Lord Elko was in Perth. You're lacking ammunition and supplies, what do you do? 
This was the first test of our hero's generalship. A matter of days ago, it was just him and two mates hiding out in the woods over there. Their only hope is to raid the supplies in Perth. But to do that, they're going to have to defeat the larger, better provisioned army led by Lord Elko. On the way, James Graham, the Marquis of Montrose, stopped at this church to ask the minister for a drink of water. So what happened when Montrose left the minister to head for Perth? First of all, a huge thanks to my friends Paul Philippou and Rob Hans for the detail of the battle. As well as writing the book Battleground Perthshire with a description of this battle to Premier, their little independent publishing business supports new authors. And so I'd ask you to support them. You'll get a full list of the titles from Tippermuir Books through the link in the description below. Now, with the professional soldiers of the Scottish Covenant and Army away in the south fighting against Charles I, the Covenant and troops at the Battle of Tippermuir were inexperienced, but well-equipped foot soldiers and cavalry who were largely driven by religious zeal. Jesus and no quarter. The Irish and Highlanders in Montrose forces were battle-hardened from their exertions in this War of the Three Kingdoms in Ireland. If they lost today, they had nowhere to go. Many had been ill-treated and thrown off their lands by the Campbell, whose army lurked at their backs in Stirling. For them, this was personal. Montrose and his men advanced from the east along the old Gallows Road towards Perth. The Covenanton force left Perth by the same road and the two forces met on the ground in between. Covenanton forces lined up with their foot soldiers in the middle behind nine cannon, flanked by cavalry on either side. Lord Elko's on the right and Scott of Rosses on the left. Montrose had no cavalry, so instead of lining up his men six deep as was customary at the time, they were stretched out three deep to try to cover the width of the opposing forces without being outflanked. Knowing that the Royalists lacked ammunition as well as cavalry, a group of Covenanters were sent forward in a fainting movement in the hope of disrupting Royalist lines and drawing fire to waste the Royalists' meagre resources. This forlorn force didn't fall back to their lines so much as run into the middle of their own forces. Matros realised, these fannies don't know what they're up to. And immediately he sent the Royalist forces forward. Now, remember, they didn't have the ammunition to get involved in any continued shooting. The Highland Charge, deployed for the first time by Montrose here in Scotland, involved advancing within range, firing one volley, then charging towards the enemy, some with sword, but some simply turning their muskets round butt first to use as bludgeons. As they ran like berserkers out of the smoke of the musket volley, the Covenant of Levies turned and ran. On the Covenant on left, Scott Rossi led his cavalry towards the Royalist right. Montrose led his men from that position on high ground, and as the horse approached, Montrose's Highlanders charged down the hill, throwing stones at them, and the cavalry force crumbled. All the Covenant forces were now in flight back towards the perceived safety of Perth. But in the rout, it's estimated that of the 3,000 Covenanter infantry, a thousand lay dead along the old Gallows Road to Perth, killed by a poorly equipped but experienced and well-led smaller force. In the year which followed the Battle of Tipper Muir here on the 1st of September 1644, Montrose won victories at Aberdeen on the 13th of September before heading west to victory at Inverlochy on the 2nd of February, east again to an Aldern on the 9th of May and then Afford on the 2nd of July, south to Kilsyth on the 15th of August before finally facing a defeat to overwhelming numbers at Philippaw and the borders on the 13th of September. Normally, he faced larger, better equipped forces arrayed against them, but repeatedly won the day in what became known as the Year of Miracles. Now, be under no illusions. Montrose's forces committed atrocities as bad, if not worse, than Cromwell's forces who followed on the other side. To suggest that war involves good guys on one side and bad guys on the other seems willfully naive to me. 
This video wasn't meant to address rights or wrongs, but to ask the question, was this possibly the greatest military general Scotland has known? There'll be more videos in Montrose to follow. If you want to hear about another incredible mercurial military leader, this time at sea, then watch my video about Sir Thomas Cochrane, Scotland's greatest sea captain. Hamidoch is going to be a lamb, Ali. Cheering, Rasta.